the creature found himself on the floor of Dedos, Dedos Labyrinth, built to protect men from the creature and the creature from men. A floor plan from which no one who entered found a way out and whose countless interlaced walls were made of glass so that the creature not only cowered facing his own reflection, but the reflections of his reflections. He saw an uncountable number of creatures like him before him. He was in a world filled with cowering creatures without knowing that he himself was the creature. He was almost numb. He didn't know where he was or what the carrying creatures around him wanted. Perhaps, perhaps he was only dreaming, even though he didn't really know what a dream was, what reality was. to drive away the cowering creatures. At the same time, his reflections jumped up. He ducked and his reflections with him. They refused to be driven away. He, he stared the reflection closest to him. Slowly crept away and his reflection crept away from him. His right foot bumped into a wall. He flung himself around and landed head to head with his reflection. Crept carefully backwards. His reflection crept carefully backwards. He automatically touched his head and as he touched it, his reflections touched their heads. He stood up and within his reflections, he saw down his body and compared it to the body of, of his reflections. And his reflections saw down their bodies and compared them to 
tear your bodies. And as he looked at himself and his reflections, he realized that he resembled his reflections. He believed to be one of many identical beings. His face turned friendlier. The faces of his reflections turned friendlier. He waved to them. They waved back. He waved with his right hand. They waved with the left. But he didn't know what was right and what was left. <laughs> he moved. He stretched his arms. He bellowed. And with him a myriad of light beings moved. Stretched their arms. Bellowed. A thousandfold his echo hit back and seemed to bellow without end. A sense of happiness overcame him. He touched his reflection with his right hand, touched his reflection's left hand, which felt smooth and cold. In front of him, reflections touched the reflections of their reflections. He got excited, performed vaults and somersaults, and with him vaulted, somersaulted an infinity of reflections. From the running and somersaulting, from the leaping and the handwalks, his excitement became so great that he felt like a leader, or more like a god, had he known what a god was. eyes and within cowered and stared his reflections dancing the creature had seen creatures between his dancing reflections they didn't dance and their reflections would not obey him The 
the girl reflected like the cowering creature stood fixed naked with long black hair between the cowering creatures they were everywhere in front of her next to her behind her just as she was everywhere before him next to him behind him the girl didn't dare to move her anxious eyes fixed on the creature that cowered before her and was closest to her. She knew there was only one creature, that the other carrying creatures were mere reflections, but she didn't know which one was creature, which one was reflection. She only knew her flight from him had led her to him. And she saw her reflection next to the carrying creatures. And farther ahead, she saw herself from behind. And next to her, the carrying creature from behind. And so forth, through endless spaces. With her hands crossing her breast, she watched spellbound the still carrying creature. She believed she could touch him. She believed she could feel his breath. She believed she could hear him panting. His enormous head covered with a pale, light brown coat was that of an aurox. The high forehead, wide and overgrown with matted woolly hair. Horns short and so crooked, their tips stood right above their roots. The reddish eyes seemed rather small compared to his skull, and the sockets in which they lay were raised. His eyes were bottomless. The softly slanted, massive bridge of his nose led to misshapen nostrils. From his mouth hung a bluish red tongue and below the chin, a matted, slobbery beard. All of this would have been bearable, but the unbearable was the transition of bull to man. A mountain of bristly and then straight hair arched over the Yorok skull, from whose bones and strands grew two human arms that rested on the glass floor. It was as though the tremendous head and the hum had grown out of a man's body who cowered, ready to leap before the girl. The Minotaur rose to his feet. He was gigantic. He suddenly realized that there were other things than Minotaurs. His world had doubled. He saw the girl's everywhere reflected eyes, the mouth, the long black hair that flowed over her shoulders. He saw the white skin, the neck, the breasts, the belly, the loins, the thighs, how it all blended. How it all flowed into each other. He advanced towards her. She backed away as she moved towards him somewhere else. He chased her through the labyrinth. She fled. It was as if a whirlwind had jumbled together minotaurs and girls. This is how they whirled apart together and towards each other. And when the girl ran into his arms, when he all at once felt her body, the warm flesh dripping with sweat. And not the hard glass he felt until now. He realized that until now, 
he had lived in a world in which only minotaurs existed, each trapped in a glass prison. And now he felt another body, felt other flesh. The girl wrenched herself free of his grip. He let it happen. She flinched, her large eyes focusing on him. And when he began to dance, the girl began to dance. And both of their reflections danced along with them. He danced his hideousness. She danced her beauty. He danced the joy of having found her. She danced the fear of having been found by him. He danced his salvation as she danced her fate. He danced his lust and she danced her curiosity. He danced his advance and she danced her retreat. He danced his penetration she danced her embrace. They danced. And their reflections danced. And he didn't know that he took the girl. And he also didn't know that he was killing her. For he didn't know what life was. What death was. Inside of him, was just nothing but uncontainable happiness and lust, but one with violence. In the mirrors, minotaurs picked up girls and the roars were a monstrous scream. A powerful, universal scream. As if nothing else existed but this scream that blended with the scream of the girl. And then he lay there. And in the mirrors lay minotaurs and the girl's white, 
naked body, the large black eyes, lay there reflecting in the walls. He lifted the left arm, it fell. The right one, he fell. Arms fell everywhere. He licked her with his giant bluish red tongue, her face, her breasts, but the girl remained lifeless. All the girls remained lifeless. He rolled her, he nudged her around with, with his horns. The girl didn't move. Not one girl moved. He got up, he looked around. Minotaur stood everywhere, looking around and everywhere. The girls' white bodies lay at their feet. He bent down, picked up the girl, roared, moaned, lifted the girl towards the dark sky. Everywhere, Minotaurs bent down, picked up girls, roared, moaned, and lifted girls towards the sky. And then he put the girl between the glass walls. He lay beside her and fell asleep. And with him all minotaurs lying prone on the ground full of the girl's wide naked bodies. He slept and dreamt of the girl with the black hair and the large eyes, chasing her, playing with her, grabbing her, loving her. <laughs> The sun broke through the glass walls and burned its picture into his brain <clears throat> as a giant turning wheel <clears throat> tossing sheaves of fire into the sky as a sign of its fury over daughter Pasiphae's sacrilege had given birth to a creature <clears throat> that as an offense to the gods and a curse to man was damned to be not God not man, <coughs> not animal, <coughs> but simply minotaur. At once, innocent and guilty. And as he lay there, charged by the sun, and it's endlessly 
reflected light. He noticed a foot among the shadows, a foot that resembled his. He thought it was the girl. He thought she'd come back to life. And she wanted to play with it. <clears throat> balla, balla, balla. Si balla ancora. Balla, balla, balla. Balla per me. Il tuo sorriso mi colla. È un suono dolce. Il tuo sorriso mi colla. Balla per me. Sto aspettando il tramonto. Sto aspettando solo te. Sto aspettando il veleno da ingoiare insieme a te. Balla, balla. Balla, balla. Balla, balla. lifted his head and now he saw two feet retreating he got up before him stood a creature that resembled the girl but wasn't just the girl that carried a tattered cape in, 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 in its left hand and a sword in its right the minor didn't know what a cape was or what a sword or a sword was he only knew that the minotos and the girls had left him even his girl must have left, for she was no longer there. He was expelled from his world of minotaurs, alone with a creature that, watching him, stepped back, stood still, and walked towards and away from him. Full of goodwill, the minotaur approached it. He was happy to be playing and chasing through the corridors. Perhaps the creature would lead him to the other minotaurs and to the girls and to the creatures that were like this new one. But, but he had to be more careful, more tender, otherwise it would break. It would become lifeless. The minotaur snorted with joy and when the creature swung its cape again, he began to dance. In front of the walls, radiating with sunlight, the two of them moved like shadows. The dancing and jumping, the clapping and then again, fast stamping minotaur, the cape swinging, advancing or retreating creature, attacking again and again with its sword it brought, hidden under its cape, to the labyrinth to kill the minotaur. And now, facing him and his innocence, it felt to shame. The Minotaur danced around him, clapping hands and stomping feet. He danced his joy of no longer being alone. He danced his hope of meeting the other Minotaurs, the girls, the creature who were like the one he was dancing with now. He forgot the sun while dancing. He forgot the curse. He was but cheerful, light, friendly, tender. He danced and the creature lurked and jumped around the Minotaur. And when the sun was setting, their reflections just became visible through the sun's thousandfold reflections.
le tue mani ancora un po' curami sì per davvero poi ti ringrazierò curami qui alla fontana presto guarirò curami con le tue acque dolci e fresche le berrò sono un fragile germoglio che la luce aiuterà sono un fragile germoglio che col tempo crescerà. che la luce aiuterà, sono un fragile germoglio che col tempo crescerà. E il Minotaur danced, happy to have found the Minotaurs and the new creatures. Soon he would find the girl he'd taken, the girl who'd become lifeless and then left. The two danced towards each other and danced away from each other. The reflections met, covered themselves, shot through themselves, everywhere. And Minotaur danced around, spun around, and everywhere the boy leaped out and back, recoiling, then bounced, poised to strike. And as the sun was setting beyond the labyrinth, and the walls were lighting up in deep red, he struck, jumped back, leaned against the wall, and stared at the Minotaur, who made a few last dancing steps with the sword in his chest, stopped, pulled out the sword with his right hand, startled, looked at it. With his left hand grabbed his chest from which blackness oozed, tossed the sword away from him so that he slid across the ground, pressed his right hand too against his chest, stumbled, seemed to fall and stood again fixed. He was confused. He didn't understand what was staining his hands and what caused this raging pain in his chest. He only felt that this creature had jumped on him and thrust something into his body that he didn't love him the way the others had loved him. The Minotaurs, the girl, the girls. And as he felt this, he became suspicious. Maybe the girl hadn't actually loved him. And the other girls hadn't really loved the Minotaurs. That's why they acted lifeless and left. Maybe they belonged to this new creature and looked like a girl, but then again, didn't. With a body almost as strong as his that had jumped in, just like the other new creatures that had jumped, the other minotaurs who, like him, pressed their hands against their chest that oozed blackness. And as the six other girls and the six other boys appeared, reaching for each other's hands, so as not to break the never-ending chain of lost beings in the mirrors. As they found the fellow who was leaning against the wall and hoping the Minotaur would finally collapse, the bull man felt as if all mankind were falling over him to destroy him. He crouched, he felt threatened. And in order to not be afraid, he set his fear against his pride, the pride of being a Minotaur. And whatever wasn't a Minotaur was his enemy. 
only minotaurs had the right to be in the labyrinth. The only world that existed for him, the only world that ever existed. Hate came over him. The hate and animal harbors against the man who tames it, abuses it, hunts it, slaughters it, eats it. The primal hate that smolders in every animal. His eyes filled with rage. He foamed at the mouth, and as the boy broke away from the wall, because he misjudged the minotaur scratching as its death, convinced that he frankly wounded it. And as the humans, the girls and the boys, not noticing its rage, formed a circle around the crouching beast and cheered while dancing wildly around the minotaur, ever faster, ever more excited, as they were saved ever madder, without thinking that they were already lost in the labyrinth. Ever more careless in their supposed freedom, drawing the jeering circle smaller and smaller, ever more threatening in the coming darkness of the night, where he saw only humans and no longer his own reflections. For the spinning around and jumping around humans blocked his view of the labyrinth's walls so that they could not reflect his image any longer and the Minotaur felt abandoned and betrayed by the other Minotaurs. He rolled his eyes, snorted, lowered himself, flexed his muscles, shot up, ran, gored the girl and disappeared with her, hurling her continuously into the labyrinth. After that, snorting angrily, returning with blood, smeared horns, he found the humans tightly huddled together in a shadowy ball. The moon was coming up somewhere beyond the labyrinth. The night, scarcely tinted by the color of the sunken sun, lit up. The Minotaur attacked, struck the soft mess of white bodies, burrowed through it, struck again, wallowed in it, trampled around, stuck down, gored, shredded, hit, slashed, while it collapsed all around it, hacked, cracked, gritted, tore, and smacked around so that the screaming and howling human ball the Minotaur raged through was shrouded by a dense flutter of chattering vultures. Silenzio che ti porta via 
Mi prego resta continua a danzare, li voglio i tuoi occhi nei miei. Ma un eco di suore, i miei zoccoli neri, calpestano oscure ombre ormai. The man who was alone, blind, blinded by the moon, he saw his reflections again as black shadows on the cold walls that slid into themselves and grew together into a labyrinth of shadows within the labyrinth. He lifted his arms, threatened with his fists, shook them, and within his reflections, lifted their arms, threatened with their fists, shook them which made his rage so intense, he threw himself head down and blind against the first shadow. He broke through the wall and searched furiously for his reflection amongst the broken bits of glass, the reflection that seemed buried beneath the shattered glass. He struck again with his giant head, and when he saw his reflection on the next wall, he still didn't understand, attacked it again, roaring through himself, head first against it, thinking his reflection was doing the same. He bounced back, searched with raging red orc eyes for his reflection. They, like him, looked at him with raging red orc eyes. Again, he ran against it, harder, bounced back even harder, landed on his back. Looking at this moon world, he saw the traitor's face, covered in fur, the broad forehead overgrown with matted wool, covered by a mountain of broken glass, sparkling bluishly in the moonlight. The mentor panted and steam from his nostrils fogged over the mirror he was approaching, whereupon he could no longer see his reflection. He wiped his hand across the wetness spontaneously to drive away the fog and, surprised to see the traitor's giant face appear behind the cold surface, he bashed it instinctively with his forehead, hit the wall instead of the other's forehead that was in the wall, not outside of it. Big me, big me, 
he was startled, he, st he stepped away. All at once he felt that the creature in front of him was just like him, but a traitor at the same time. Because he was different, because he was his enemy. Anything that wasn't like him, that couldn't be caught, that was untouchable. Though he felt right from the start when he awoke in the labyrinth that there was something mysterious between him and the other Minotaurs, something wall-like. But because he danced around with them like their leader, like a king, like their god, he hadn't paid attention. But now, after he'd taken the girl and pressed his body onto and into hers, and after he gored and shredded the other humans from whose bodies it was red and warm, just like from his own, he felt how fake the creature before him was that had betrayed him, yet, like him, was full of broken glass. And perhaps his own face was smeared with blood like the traitor's. He touched his face, looked at his hands. His face too was smeared with blood. He watched his reflection suspiciously, acted as if he didn't watch it. He sensed it wasn't what it seemed to be. He was horrified and curious at the same time. He moved back here his reflection also. Gradually he realized that he stood in front of himself. He tried to run, but no matter where he turned, he always faced himself. He was walled in by himself. He was everywhere. He was infinite, eternally reflected by the labyrinth into infinity. He felt there weren't many Minotaurs. There was only one Minotaur. And there was only one creature like him. No other creature was before or after him. That he was the only one who was at once locked out and locked in. That the labyrinth existed because of him, because of his birth only, because something like him shouldn't exist for the sake of separation between man and beast, set by the gods to keep the world in order and not let it turn into a labyrinth, back into a state of chaos from which it sprang. And as he felt this, as a feeling without understanding, as his enlightenment without cognition, Dormono le stelle, dormono nel cielo, dormono lontane più che mai. E mi sento vuoto di pensieri, era solo ieri che ti avevo, sai. Ti perdo a sognare, mi perdo a cantare. Io mi sento stupido, ma tanto stupido, idiota più che mai. E 
portò quello che hai detto come una ferita aperta sulla massa. Mi perdono il sogno, mi perdono Minotaur dreamt of being human. He dreamt of language. He dreamt of brotherhood. He dreamt of friendship. He dreamt of security. He dreamt of love, of closeness, of warmth. And you, at the same time that he was a monster, that neither love nor language nor brotherhood nor friendship nor love nor closeness no warmth would ever happen to him Dream as men dream of gods. With the sadness of men, he dreamt of man. With the sadness of animals, he dreamt of the mind of God. E mi sento vuoto di pensieri, era solo ieri che ti avevo sai. Mi perdono sognare, mi perdono cantare, mi perdono sognare con This is how Ariadne found it, sleeping. She came dancing with a ball of wool, which she let unroll and dancing almost tenderly. She wrapped the end of the red thread around his horns, danced along the thread out of the labyrinth. And when the Minotaur awoke in a glassy morning, he saw him faintly reflected a minotaur walking towards him, his eyes fixed firmly on the red thread, as if on a trail of blood. First, the minotaur thought it was his own reflection, though he still didn't understand what a reflection was. But then he realized that the other minotaur walked towards him while he still lay on the ground. This baffled him. The Minotaur stood up but didn't notice the red thread whose end was wrapped around his horns. The other one came closer. The Minotaur threw both his arms up in the air. The other one did the same. The Minotaur became leery, the other one could have been his own reflection. Then it seemed again as if the other Minotaur didn't throw up his hands simultaneously with him. Usually, the reflections did everything at the same time. But he could have been mistaken for both were being reflected and the other stood still now. The Minotaur made a dance step. The reflections too, but this time many reflections danced with a slight delay and he could notice it clearly. 
the Minotaur stood still again and peered at the other Minotaur standing still. He moved the small finger on his right hand, focused on the other Minotaur, moved his finger again, the other one moved his right small finger which alarmed him. The other seemed to have moved the finger of the wrong hand. As the Minotaur traced all the possibilities, he suddenly saw that there was something attached to the other Minotaur's loin. From the loin of the other Minotaur's reflection, something felt like, something he didn't know. But that proved to him that he was facing another Minotaur or its reflection. The Minotaur cried out, even though it was more of a roar than a cry. A long owl, a loud mooing and yelping of happiness around him, no longer being the only one. The one who's both locked in and locked out. And there being a second Minotaur, not only his eye, but a you. from his sheath made of pearl. And as the Minotaur fell into the other's open arms, trusting to have found a friend, the creature like him, as his reflection fell into the arms of the other's reflection, the other struck, and his reflection struck, and the other's dagger struck his back so perfectly that the Minotaur was already dead as he hit the ground.
Theseus took off his bull mask and all of his reflections took off their bull masks. Recoil the red thread and just disappeared from the labyrinth. And all of his reflections recoil the red threads and disappear from the labyrinth. That no longer endlessly reflected anything but the Minotaur's dark carcass. Then, before the sun came, came the vultures. <laughs> Thank you, Captain, for your 